My, my cut up said if the diastolic blood pressure 110 or more is persistent, then I would pre treat it somewhere within about 60 minutes period. I don't treat it after 15 minutes. One elevations, I will not treat at all. For the systolic blood pressure, if it is 160, I have to take into consideration the diastolic blood pressure. Even though the document said you need to treat the systolic and respond, I believe there is a major problem first. A lot of our pregnant women are obese, and there is errors in measuring blood pressure in these patients. The second important thing, most of the units in labor and delivery now using the electronic methods, and these are unreliable in measurement of the blood pressure. So this might lead to excessive treatment of patients, and in some of these women who have severe preeclampsia or severe gestational hypertension, if they have plasma volume depletion, they are going to be a sudden decrease in blood pressure, and this will translate into mark reduction in placenta blood flow, which means these patients are more likely to be rushed for cesarean section because of non-reassuring fetal testing. Because of that, I'm really very careful about how aggressive we are going to be in treating blood pressure. It's not a big issue in the postpartum period because you are not worried about placenta blood flow. But before delivery, I'm very reluctant to use the new recommendation about treating after 15 minutes. For example, it makes sense, you know, to treat somebody whose blood pressure is 240 over 140. You don't want to wait for one hour. However, somebody who is 160 over 70, it doesn't make any sense to say I'm going to treat them after 15 minutes. And once you have a diagnosis of fetal growth restriction, I don't use the term IGR because really we have to go into the less than fifth percentile. Based on all of this available currently in all the studies, including two of the ones I have done, once you have severe fetal growth restriction and severe preeclampsia, pregnancy have to be delivered after 72 hours. And the 72 hours is to allow for the benefits of steroids. No, this is in the presence of abnormal Doppler flow, definitely, because once we have fetal growth restriction, then the pregnancy has to be managed with Doppler. Now, I differentiate between the two. If the pregnancy is less than 30 weeks, I will require the addition of the Doppler. But after 30 weeks, I really don't need the Doppler if they are, because the gestational age is very important regarding survival. I'm more tolerant for fetal growth restriction very early in pregnancy if the Doppler is not markedly abnormal versus if you have fetal growth restriction after 30 weeks and then I don't want really the Doppler anymore. I'll come to develop, deliver them if they are less than first person time. Again, you know, the issue of the whole treatment of chronic hypertension is that we do not have very decent studies regarding the management of chronic hypertension. Based on the available data, but the sample size is not adequate, it doesn't appear that antihypertensive medications change the rate of superimposed preeclampsia. However, giving antihypertensive medications reduces the likelihood of a woman having severe hypertension. From this perspective, it makes sense to treat mater mild hypertension in pregnancy. There is another group of women, if they have target organ damage, and these are the women who have hypertension more than four or five years, patients who have more than 35 years old, those who have pre-existing abnormal echo, patients who have renal disease. We recommend treating every one of those to keep the blood pressure below 140 and below 90. For women who have diabetes and hypertension, we recommend lowering the blood pressure to one less, less than 130 and less than 80 millimeter. So really, we take all of this into consideration. Okay, if the patient comes with postpartum preeclampsia without symptoms, I will only give them medication to lower their blood pressure. If the patient comes with symptoms, such as headaches, blurred vision, if they have epigastric pain, if they have shortness of breath, 
wake up the magnesium sulfate for at least 24 hours. But the whole idea of the management is trying to treat the blood pressure. Then I have to look about what medications they are on. Because some of these patients might have been receiving methargen, where their physician sent them an oral medications because they had uterine atony. So I want to make sure I have to stop that. The second thing, I have to look at non-steroidal anti-inflammatory because almost every pregnant woman in the United States is discharged home in about 600 milligrams three to four times daily of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. And these medications tend to increase blood pressure. So this is the two important things. The third thing I look for, does the patient having some symptoms of thyroid? We know that postpartum thyroiditis is really very common. Usually the first phase of postpartum thyroiditis is hyperthyroidism. And in general, these women tend to have systolic hypertension and they have a white pulse pressure. So this is the first thing I look at. If you have a white pulse pressure, if the hypertension is mostly systolic, I immediately order thyroid test because these women most likely having the hypertension related to postpartum thyroiditis. No, there is no need for women with postpartum hypertension or preeclampsia to be managed in patient. What I will do is that if the patient has symptoms, the answer is yes. They have to be admitted because you need to give them magnesium sulfate. If the patient has severe hypertension that persistent, if you can control the blood pressure in an observation period, over four hours period, you should be able, then they can be discharged home on medication. So really, the requirement for hospitalization is that if you are not sure of the diagnosis, if you are going to give them magnesium sulfate, or you cannot control their blood pressure, this will be the indications for them to be in the hospital. It depends, you know, how far is it. If they are more than 72 hours, the answer is yes. It's very difficult to know what you are dealing with. What we are realizing now, there is a new syndrome called postpartum cerebral vasoconstriction. The syndrome, it mimics in everything in clamsia, including what you find in image. These patients, they start with headache. Most of these women will not have hypertension before pregnancy or even in labor. So they started the first time postpartum. Their first presentation will be headache. They will have hypertension. Some of them will have proteinuria. It's very difficult to know without doing really the imaging. And to make the diagnosis in these patients, you have to do angiography because this is the only way you can make the diagnosis. And in angiography, we look for the presence of vasospasm or vasoconstriction in the blood vessels. I think the best screening method is the patient history. We know the best prediction is if a woman had previous preeclampsia. And those who had early are at very high risk of having it again. We know that women who have pre-existing chronic hypertension, they are at count to risk for preeclampsia. And the risk is going to depend on duration of hypertension, severity of hypertension. We know women who have pre-gestational diabetes are at very risk again. The risk of preeclampsia in this group will be dependent on the duration of the diabetes and how good the control was prior to conception or early in pregnancy. We know that women who are obese are at risk, and the risk increase dependent on, on the body mass index. So knowing this information, we can really take care of almost half of the patients and all that. There have been a lot of studies and markers that have been introduced currently Unfortunately, none of them has been to be very useful, and the main reason is all of them have focused on predicting early onset preeclampsia less than 34 weeks. But this really constitutes less than three to four patients per 1,000. The problem is when people are using these tests, it's giving them the false sense of security because or what you are saying, whether the patient is going to have preeclampsia less than 34 weeks. You still have all the other women who are more than 99% of all preeclamptic 
who are going to be at risk of having this, and your test will not identify it. Second important thing, if you really identify these four out of 1,000, what are you going to do with the information? You are going to scare this woman because now the false positive rate is somewhere between 5 to 10 percent. So you are going to call a lot of women, produce anxiety on them, where they are not going to be at risk. And this is why the new task force suggested that you should not use any of these tests at the present time for screening for preeclampsia. Based on all the studies, and really the best data came from the Paris Collaborative, we were part of it, which used individual patient data meta-analysis. And they found that the likelihood of aspirin reducing preeclampsia is about 10 to 15 percent. So really, the benefit is very, very small. However, considering the fact that baby aspirin, if you started at 13 weeks, and continue with the 34 or 36 week, the cost is only about $2, and it has no side effect, we elected to recommend this. In patients who had prior preeclampsia leading to delivery before 34 weeks, or those who had recurrent preeclampsia. So these are the only two groups we recommend giving baby aspirin for them, starting at 13 weeks gestation. That's perfect. That's all I have. Good. That's great. Thank this you. was That's fun. Great. Yeah. We